Um, so yeah, good morning. Um, my name's Jo Brown and I'm a research scientist at the Bureau of Meteorology. And um, the primary focus of my research at the moment is actually on the Australian monsoon and looking at how the Australian monsoon is predicted um, to change in a warmer world. Um, and I also collaborate with um, a lot of other scientists on climate change and climate variability work. So <clears throat> my presentation today is really just an introduction to the topic of monsoons because it's such a, uh, such a large topic. And I've drawn quite a lot of material from the introduction to tropical meteorology text, which I found to be quite useful, and also some material from Matt Wheeler, who's a research scientist at the Bureau, um, who's also done a lot of work on monsoons and the Madden-Julian oscillation. So just an outline of what I'll be going through today. I'll start with um, just a discussion of the general mechanisms, uh, the, the definition of the monsoon and the mechanisms that uh, bring a monsoon about. And then I'll go into some examples of regional monsoons, the um, South Asian and East Asian, African and American, which is some people argue is not a monsoon. Um, and then the Australian monsoon, the Australian or maritime continent monsoon. And I'll give a bit more detail about that since that's the one that I've actually had a lot more <coughs> experience in, um, in researching. I'll talk about the variability of the monsoon, both on interannual and also intra-seasonal uh, timescales. And finally, I'll finish up looking a little bit at um, what may happen to monsoons in a future warmer world. So um, the, the word monsoon is believed to come from the Arabic of Moisim, I uh, probably pronounce that completely wrongly, um, meaning season. But obviously those that live in the regions of the world which experience the monsoon have had many words for it and have understood it um, for, for hundreds of years. Um, and it was first, uh, I guess, defined in relation to the, um, the South Asian or Indian Ocean region. Interestingly, um, Edmund Haley, who's uh, famous for his discovery of the comet, um, went back in, eight, uh, in 1686, proposed um, that the monsoon winds were driven by the differential heating over land and ocean. So he um, came up with a very simple model that uh, you would expect as there's heating over land, uh, a pressure gradient would drive an onshore flow. And that was the sort of first attempt to um, come up with a, a physical model for the observed phenomenon of monsoons. And I, I really love this, um, this map here, which was drawn um, in, back in 1686. Uh, so you can see that some of the continents are a little bit um, different to what we know they look like today. In particular, Australia over here looks a little bit unusual. Um, but we can see that they already had <coughs> mapped out um, some of the key circulations. In particular, um, the onshore flow here associated with the West African monsoon uh, was identified or mapped for the first time back in 1686. Um, and then following on from that, um, Hadley, the one who we named the Hadley cell after, suggested that it wasn't a simple matter of an onshore flow driven by the differential heating of land and ocean because that would lead to um, a flow in a, a meridional direction, but rather there must be an additional um, uh, rotational component due to the Coriolis force. So he um, basically added an understanding of what drives the deflection of the winds as, um, as they move across the equator. And, um, <clears throat> and, and those two observations were already um, quite a, a large component of our modern understanding of the monsoon system. So back um, two or three hundred years ago, we already had quite a, a good understanding of, of the basics. Um, but obviously today we have a much more detailed um, observational picture of what the, um, the global season, seasonal cycle looks like. And so we know now that um, the, there's a, a seasonal reversal of winds in many parts of the world. Um, in particular, in January, you can see over northern Australia this um, northwesterly flow, and conversely, um, the, <coughs> the northeast, northeast trade winds coming from South Asia. Um, we know that the heat lows are driven over land by the seasonal heating, so in particular, in the southern hemisphere winter, we have a large heat low over Australia and also over South America and southern Africa. And we know that the ITCZ is displaced, as I'm sure Chris uh, talked about this morning, is displaced southwards in Southern Hemisphere summer. <clears throat> if we look at the Northern Hemisphere summer, we observe <coughs> the winds rotating in towards um, the South Asian region, also towards West Africa, and um, to some extent into, into North America as well. 
uh, we see these strong uh, heat lows over America, to some extent over the Saharan region and also over the Tibetan plateau um, in the <coughs> and on the hemisphere summer, driving the, the onshore winds and, of course, the northward displacement um, of the ITCZ. Uh, when we look at the rainfall, the seasonal precipitation, we also see some regions where there's a very strong contrast between win uh, winter and summer. So, in particular, um, northern Australia has a very, very wet climate uh, in January, but in the southern hemisphere, <coughs> winter is extremely dry, and the opposite is seen over South Asia, um, Africa, and to some extent, North and South America also have a very strong um, seasonal cycle in, in convection. So all these components, the circulation and the rainfall, um, make up our understanding of the monsoon today. So the paper that, um, I guess, mapped out the classical definition of the monsoon was by Ramage in 1971. And um, there's four main components that he identified to define a region where we have a monsoon. There's a, a strong shift in the wind direction between the January and, and July seasons. Um, the average frequency of the prevailing winds uh, greater than 40%, so that means that at least um, almost half the time we have to have that prevailing wind um, direction. The wind speed must be greater than three metres per second, and there's a steadiness criteria for the pressure patterns, which is um, basically talking about having um, a, a, very, a relatively stable um, large-scale flow. And so the regions which actually meet these four criteria are marked out here. In the, in the yellow. And actually, um, as you can see, it's quite a large fraction of the tropics. So um, Africa through South Asia, East Asia, the Maritime Continent and, and Northern Australia are all included in that classical definition of the monsoon. Um, just to, to zoom in on some of the regional, um, the, the regions that we inc include in that, we also have um, a new addition to the monsoon system, which is the American monsoon, which uh, doesn't satisfy all the criteria. It has a very strong seasonal um, uh, uh, <coughs> cycle of rainfall. So in the, in the north here, we have a very wet um, summer, and down here in the south, a very wet summer. But it doesn't have the wind reversals that we see in the other monsoon regions. So um, I guess you can say that it's sort of a quasi-monsoon. Um, we can see here the the wind reversals uh, in, the, in the African monsoon region between summer and winter and in the Asian monsoon um, down into the Australian region in the southern hemisphere summer. So what drives the monsoon? Well, we've got some of the pieces of the picture already from our very early um, research that I mentioned. The first thing, obviously, is the seasonal oscillation of solar heating. So we have the um, displacement of net heating into the summer hemisphere and the migration of the equatorial trough, the tropical um, convergence zones that follows that solar heating. Uh, the, the second component, the one that Halley identified, is the differential heating between land and ocean. So the heat capacity of land uh, and ocean is different and therefore um, under the same heating the, the land warms up much more and drives a uh, pressure gradient. So we have here um, a simple schematic of that where you have warm conditions over land, um, low pressure, and then basically have um, cooler conditions over ocean and a, a pressure gradient driving an onshore flow, uh, then ascending and an upward um, branch of the monsoon circulation. The, the next component is the curvature of the winds, as Hadley identified. So here would be our example on a non-rotating Earth. But with the uh, rotation of the Earth, once we have um, winds coming in towards India, for example, they have that, uh, that deflection um, to <coughs> into, the, into the Indian monsoon region. And the final component was identified by um, recent, more, much more recent work, actually, by Peter Webster and colleagues, looking at the, um, the impact of moisture and the way that convection and latent heat release actually drives the monsoon and provides a positive feedback to the monsoon circulation. So I'll just go in a little bit more detail on the, the mechanisms. Um, so some of you maybe have heard the term the giant sea breeze as a description of the monsoon, although people argue that may be overly simplistic. Um, but basically, 
Um, another version of that schematic I showed before. We have um, heating air over the warm surface, pressure gradient force from ocean to land, driving um, air aloft, and then returning. And to, main, uh, to maintain continuity, basically, we have this um, ongoing monsoon circulation whilst that pressure gradient is in existence. Um, I'm probably just <laughs> repeating myself here, but I wanted to kind of give you two, uh, two looks at the same processes. Um, the Coriolis force, as you've know, probably been talking about earlier in the week, is an apparent force, uh, the deflection of the, of the winds as they um, cross the equator, and finally, the important role of moist convective or latent heating processes. So now I want to look at some of the regional monsoons in a bit more detail. Probably the most important one, certainly the largest, is the Asian monsoon system. Um, but this is really made up of a number of sub monsoons. So there's um, quite different conditions, I guess, over the, um, the South Asian, where we have the very strong effect of the Tibetan Plateau and a much uh, clearer gradient between um, North and South. And then there's the East Asian monsoon, which is also influenced um, by the Pacific, as I'll go into in a moment. And there's also a division in that uh, East Asian monsoon into a West North Pacific um, monsoon as well. So, as I said, there's quite a, um, there's quite a big difference for, um, between the, the two, South Asian and East Asian, in the sense that the South Asian monsoon has this very, very strong north-south gradient with strong heating over the Tibetan Plateau and a very simple and strong um, driving of that onshore flow, whereas the East Asian monsoon <coughs> is also driven by the SST gradient with the Pacific, and so therefore we end up with a weaker circulation and some additional rainfall along the subtropical fronts um, that occur in, <coughs> in the West Pacific. The, the Asian winter monsoon is also quite important, um, in particular over East Asia. So we have, um, in this case, obviously a very strong contrast between the cold Asian landmass and the warm North Pacific Ocean. And in this case, we have uh, driving a very strong um, offshore circulation that's across equatorial flow that comes into um, the Australian and Indonesian monsoon. And that's um, partially driven by the relatively warm land over uh, uh, Australia, but actually it's also, um, in a sense, pushed by the temperature gradient from um, the outflow from the Asian, Asian continent. Um, on the other hand, over, further over in, in, in the, uh, the Indian monsoon region, it's it's not so much the case um, because there's a, there's a blocking of the, um, the circulation over the Tibetan Plateau blocks the, um, the cold Siberian air mass. So it's more, the, the East Asian monsoon is more important for the winter monsoon circulation. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the West African monsoon. This is um, one, of the, one of the monsoons that does match the classical definition. So we have in the, um, <coughs> in the summer monsoon season, we have these moist, cool southwesterly winds bringing in a lot of rainfall to this region. And to the north, we have this so called intertropical front that mar match, uh, marks the edge of that rainfall. And then coming from um, the north in the dry season, very, very dry, warm air that also tends to be quite dusty as well, not surprisingly, as it's coming off the Sahara region. Um, it's also. Uh, Important, I haven't really got time to go into this, but there's a lot of interannual variability of the extent of this monsoon. So um, over, over Africa, we have a really strong gradient up to from <coughs> quite sort of lush up until very dry desert um, conditions in the Sahara. And the edge here in the Sahel experiences a lot strong interannual variability. And so um, the years when they have a failure of the monsoon rains, for example, as occurred over <coughs> some recent decades, they can have um, very severe droughts and famines occurring. The American monsoon um, are the ones that have a monsoon in rainfall but not in, in winds, as we talked about. So the, um, the summer heating in the North, no North American component occurs over the Sonoran Desert up here and drives uh, onshore circulation from the Gulf of California and also the Gulf, uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Um, although over uh, some 
some orographic uh, barriers there. Um, and down in the southern uh, American monsoon, we mainly have an inflow of moisture from the tropical Atlantic and also the Amazon River Basin. But as you can see, um, that circulation is to, a, to an extent obstructed as well by the Andes um, on the eastern side of the continent. So it ends up having kind of a, um, a rotation in, <coughs> in the meridional direction there. And finally, the Australian Indonesian monsoon is often talked about in the context of the, the Asian um, Australian monsoon as a single system, a northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere system. But this, the, the bit that we talk about in, um, in this region, we, we generally call the Australian and Indonesian or Australian maritime continent uh, monsoon. So there's outflow from, as I said before, from the northern hemisphere coming across the equator in northern hemisphere winter and flowing in as the north, northwesterly flow onto um, the northern northern Australian region and um, I'll go into some more detail about what the Australian monsoon consists of um, in a moment. So the Australian monsoon, uh, it peaks in January and February. Uh, we look at these um, sort of monthly average uh, images here which are OLR, so outgoing long wave radiation is telling us essentially the intensity of, um, of convection and the 850 uh, near surface winds which may be a little hard to see, but anyway, um, you can see that the, the monsoon onset is occurring generally around December as we see this, this OLR um, minimum shifting down towards Australia. And um, you can see the, the monsoon shear line identified in the red line here, which separates the monsoon westerlies from the trade wind easterly. So we begin to have a westerly circulation over northern Australia around December or January. It's really only at the very northern tip that you'll have a mean westerly, if you look at the, the monthly means. Um, to the north of that is the location where we would classify the ITCZ sitting over the, the region of maximum um, convection, the lowest OLR. And the monsoon intensity continues through December, January, February, March, and then it tends to um, basically retreat around March, um, varying a little bit from year to year. So again, just to point out those key features, the ITCZ is located somewhat to the north um, where we have our strongest rainfall and convection. And then over the continent itself, we get the monsoon shear line uh, where the winds, the westerly winds, um, meet the, the easterly winds. And we have the development of the monsoon trough um, over the continent. So I'll just go a little bit more through the two stages, I guess, the build up to the monsoon and then the, mon the active monsoon. Um, this is a few different graphics that might be interesting depending on if you can read all the details. There's a um, synoptic chart here for the 4th of January 2006 and the corresponding uh, cloud and rainfall maps as well from the Bureau's website. So this is an example of just prior to the, the onset in this particular case, we, develop, we have the development of heat lows over northern Australia. They're typically, um, the Pilbara heat low is the most important one and also sometimes one over in Queensland, the Concurry as well. And they can sometimes join up to form this heat trough right over the north of the continent. And um, we then get some isolated thunderstorms developing in, uh, in that region and also you can see some isolated rainfall. So this is just prior to the, the monsoon. Another example, this is from the textbook this time, um, you can see here over the Kimberley again, the development of a low and the beginning of an onshore flow. So we have the beginning of um, basically moistening, preconditioning um, the environment for the, the onset of deep convection. And um, I actually haven't, must confess I haven't been to that part of Australia myself, but I know it's, sorry, yeah? Yeah, is there any difference between the depth of cyclonic vortices I think so, yeah. I'm not exactly sure. Um, so yeah, basically this is the build up period just before the onset of the monsoon, which is in a pretty uncomfortable time if you're in Darwin or up, up north. Uh, once the monsoon actually develops, um, we get the, whoops, <coughs> we get the 
the monsoon truffle shear line over the continent itself, um, and the lows uh, are much stronger and associated with much more intense convection. So now we can see here a whole set of very uh, large organised thunderstorms and, and <coughs> um, convective systems over northern Australia, and often there's actually a tropical cyclone embedded within that monsoon trough as well. Uh, so I think there's TC Tim, maybe, or Jim, Dim up there in the monsoon trough uh, at that time, and obviously much more intense rainfall occurring at the, at the time as well. So um, just to look at the, um, the same kind of plot, and again you can see these very intense lows here, and um, just to give a definition that uh, Wassel Drostowski developed um, was that the active monsoon is when you have mean westerly zonal winds up to 500 hectopascals and mean easterly um, above 300 hectopascals. So that's, that's one possible definition of the, <coughs> the onset of the Australian monsoon. So there's a lot of variability of monsoon systems from year to year, and um, I don't have time to go through all the different types of variability, but I just wanted to mention a couple of important ones. The tropospheric biennial oscillation, or TBO, it's, um, it's one of the major modes between um, the Asian and Australian monsoon and also the, uh, the Walker circulation, I guess, or ENSO. So basically, um, we have <coughs> a tendency from year to year to have a weak Australian monsoon followed by um, a strong Indian monsoon in the, the next winter, the next southern hemisphere winter, and then following year a strong um, Asian summer, Australian summer monsoon. And so what happens is that there's um, a set of anom anomalies develop um, in response to that circulation in SSTs and, and winds that precondition um, the region for uh, the, the following year, the monsoon. Um, the Asian monsoon to, to be strong and vice versa. And if you're interested in that, it's actually still quite an active area of research and there's some very interesting papers by, um, by Jerry Meal and, and colleagues that have looked in a lot of detail at the, um, <coughs> at the TBO. The other, obviously, the, the, one of the key players is ENSO. Um, so the, the relationship of ENSO to the monsoons is actually quite complex as well. Um, there's been a lot of research on that. And it does appear that it actually uh, also varies through time. So the South Asian summer monsoon um, is generally influenced by ENSO in that you have a weaker monsoon during an El Nino and a stronger during a La Nina, but that correlation actually has varied quite a lot over time. So decade to decade, you'll have some periods where there's a very strong relationship and others where it's weaker. Um, and there's also a reasonably significant impact on the Australian monsoon. So during an El Nino, we have drier conditions on average over eastern Australia, northeast in particular. Um, and in the years with an El Nino, we tend to get a later onset of the monsoon. So this is a little graph here showing the Southern Oscillation Index. It's negative down here, which means it's an El Nino year. And as we go through the year, um, the important point here is that the monsoon tends to be late and generally poor uh, when, when we have an El Nino. So there's, um, I guess, dynamically what's going on is that you have a, uh, <coughs> a shift in the, the Walker circulation and that, that's actually just taking the convection away from Australia and into the central Pacific. So um, we have a reduction in the intensity of Australian monsoon on average and the later, um, the later onset on average. Another important mode of variability is the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is sometimes known as the Indian Ocean Zonal Mode. So these are um, a little, maybe a little bit controversial. Some people argue that they're just a kind of an impact of ENSO on the Indian Ocean, but nonetheless, they can be identified using indices that measure the um, anomalies in the east and west of the Indian Ocean, in the tropical east and west, and following the um, SST anomalies, there are quite large changes in the regions of rainfall. So a year where we have a positive IOD phase, we'll have warmer waters over here, uh, and we'll typically have heavier rain in Africa and across through to, um, to India. Whereas the years where we have the negative phase of the IOD, the warmer waters are moving over towards Australia and Indonesia, 
and we tend to have heavier rains on that side of the Indian Ocean. But I should mention that this is the, season, the, um, the timing of the IOD events is a little bit different than um, the monsoon or ENSO. The dipole peaks um, around September, October, November, so actually um, it tends to be decaying by the end of, of the calendar year um, and is, is limited by the, uh, the onset of the monsoon wind, the, the strong monsoon winds. Um, so there's... Yeah, there's variability, I guess, associated both the, both the Asian monsoon and the Australian monsoon to some extent can be influenced by um, the state of the, the IOD. I want to turn now a little bit to intraseasonal variability. So I'm going to use the Australian monsoon as the example here because I have more um, information about that, but there's quite a lot of equally interesting examples that you could look at for the other monsoons. These are um, figures showing the, the three-day running means of... Uh, OLR, so um, in the uh, sort of a um, anomaly, I guess, that is um, showing you the, the extent of convection over the, the region here to the north of Australia, and similarly on the bottom of axis here is the rainfall anomalies over just this land area now. So it's a fairly conventional way of um, measuring the activity of the Australian monsoon. And you can see here that... Um, this is 1982, 83, 83, 84, and 84, 85. So each, each year is quite, um, quite different, both in the timing, I guess, of the, the onset. These little arrows here, um, if you can see them, are the onset defined by different measures. So there's about um, half a dozen different ways of defining the monsoon onset, but uh, they're, more, they're more or less agree. And so uh, after the monsoon onset, let's take an example down the bottom here, we have periods of very active uh, convection, so negative or um, more uh, lower OLR values, and then corresponding peaks in rainfall. And they're typically lasting for maybe a few days, a week, something of that order. And then we have periods which we call breaks. Um, so here is a, a monsoon break, and there's less rainfall, and then a very intense burst, and then a break, and then another burst. Um, and as I say, all that, yeah? What are the typical duration The typical duration? Um, I think they're several days to weeks. Like in Indian summer monsoon season, they have 5 to 10 days, right. 30 to 60 days more. So what it's, is during the monsoon? Yeah, it, I don't think we get that as long as the Indian monsoon. It's, it's more like um, of the order of about a week, something like that. So, uh, yeah? Yeah, so it's, it's a measure of the in, intense upper level clouds, basically, the, the deep convection. Yeah. <clears throat> so just um, to take you through another couple of years of the same thing, 85, 86, 86, 87, and 87, 88. Actually, I just wanted to point out, I don't know if anyone spotted this, but the years which are strong El Nino years, um, so... 82, 83 in particular um, was a really strong El Nino event. Actually, has a later onset than these other years, so it's actually happening almost in <coughs> in January, as uh, as I said before. That that's a typical El Nino signal, and I think maybe the same thing in 86, 87 as well. Um, but yeah, the, the amplitude of these bursts and breaks is quite is quite substantial. It's comparable to that of the actual seasonal cycle itself. Um, and it's usually, it's usually very abrupt as well, the transition into a burst and a break. Um, one of the main drivers of burst and breaks in our region is the Madden-Julian oscillation, which you've probably heard of before, and it will be discussed later in the week, so I don't want to steal um, Andrew's thunder, but I just wanted to mention it briefly here. So the MJO is a tropical oscillation of uh, active convection, um, circulation and convection anomalies that uh, was first described back in the 1970s, and it's typically um, initiated over the Indian Ocean and then travels through the Pacific, and because it's active in this region, not surprisingly, it has a strong impact on the Australian monsoon, and it operates around a 30 to 60 day um, time scale as it, it travels around, nearly around the globe. So um, it's very much coming into our, our domain for um, for you know, short periods and, and triggering intense um, monsoon bursts and then following those um, monsoon breaks. It's also involved actually in the development of tropical cyclones. I'm not sure if you may talk about that later on 
um, today as well. So MJO can be important in, in triggering those. Um, so just quickly show you the impact of the different phases of the MJO on our North Australian rainfall, just to, to um, support that, I guess. So um, the MJO is divided into phases, and I won't go into the details, but you can clearly see here that the ones which are the so-called active uh, phases, we have very intense rainfall over northern Australia, and that, that will be um, the times in our monsoon season where we have that, the, the most extreme rainfall will, will very, very likely be during an active MJO. So Andrew Marshall will be talking about that on Thursday, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to just um, <coughs> talk now about monsoons and climate change. Um, and this is, I guess, a topic of more my own research. So there's um, a lot of interest in how the monsoons may change in a future warmer world because obviously a very large number of people in the world live um, in regions where the monsoon brings their seasonal rains and that can be extremely important for agriculture in a lot of countries and extremes of monsoon even in the historical record have been quite devastating for people so if the monsoon is going to change in the future become more intense or more even just more unreliable that can have um, great you know human human cost so at the moment um, there's still a lot of active research on look, using climate models to predict how the monsoon will change in the future. Um, the most recent IPCC report that came out, so in 2013, the fifth assessment report, um, has quite a lot of discussion in the chapter on regional climate change about the monsoon. And it talks about um, the projections for the global monsoon, which is basically just the average of all the monsoons, and also for, <coughs> for the regional monsoons. And here, I just pulled out a couple of results. Um, the, the section over here, uh, you can sort of see, hopefully anyway, that there's an increase projected for the, uh, the Asian, East Asian and South Asian monsoon in the mean rainfall. Uh, and there's a reasonable model agreement as well on that. I think there's some kind of hash lines or something to show where the majority of the models um, in, the <coughs> in the assessment were in agreement. But over Australia in our summer, actually not a really high level of agreement. So quite uncertain what's going to happen um, to the the mean rainfall in, in the Australian region. Um, what, do we, what do we kind of think would happen based on our understanding of the mechanisms that drive the monsoon? There's a couple of different process, processes at work, I guess. Um, on the one hand, in a warmer atmosphere in general, we have more water vapour, so there's going to be more transport of moisture in a given circulation, more onshore moisture transport, um, this, this applies throughout the tropics, um, including in the monsoon. So there's more potential for heavy rainfall and also sort of a thermodynamic um, enhancement of the, um, of the mean rainfall f following just the, the classes clapron relationship that we expect a warmer atmosphere to hold more moisture. Um, there are also changes in circulation which to some extent can, can enhance or in other cases also actually weaken um, the monsoon. So, that statement is a little bit <coughs> equivocal, but basically um, we do expect an over, um, average over the tropics, we do expect a weakening in the overturning circulation. But in the cases of monsoons, um, remember that we have this, this mechanism associated with the warming of land, and we know that in a warmer climate, um, land areas are typically warming more than oceans, so we would expect an enhancement of that land-ocean um, <coughs> temperature gradient. So that's that's one um, mechanism that would tend to, inha tend to strengthen the monsoon. The overall weakening of, um, of the circulation would oppose that. And also there's additional um, components due to changes in land use, so land use, land clearing, um, and additionally aerosol loading. So particularly over the Asian region, um, there's been a lot of atmospheric aerosols produced by industrialization that have really um, contributed to a reduction in um, incoming radiation at, at the surface. And so actually those regions, we think the monsoon there has actually been uh, influenced by the aerosols already in the atmosphere and that perhaps the trends that we've seen over the last decades have been at least partly responding to the aerosols rather than responding to warming. So uh, how that will change in the future once we maybe reduce the amount of uh, aerosol loading in the atmosphere with greater 
emissions um, controls on industry in those regions, we may actually then see the warming signal being the dominant one. So not surprisingly, um, maybe we still have a lot of <laughs> unanswered questions in which of these mechanisms is most important for each of the regional monsoons. Um, the projections given in the fifth assessment report, I'll just show a few of the regional monsoon results um, on the left hand here. These are just the, the model mean for the four different um, RCP. The, the highest one in the red line here is RCP 8.5, so a very high emissions future. And the model spread basically is, is the shading here uh, for all the different, something like 40 or so models, I think, for each of the scenarios. Um, so the East Asian monsoon is showing overall an increase in, in summer monsoon rainfall, but obviously with a reasonable amount of model spread or uncertainty. Similarly, the South Asian monsoon is showing an increase. But the Australian monsoon down here, still um, possibly um, the multi model mean is, is, is for an increase, but there's a great deal of uncertainty and spread in that. Another um, set of information which you most definitely can't see on the right hand side here is just some measures of changes in variability. So there's things like the standard deviation, the second one here, PSD, is um, the interannual standard deviation of each of those monsoon rainfalls, just the area average. So most of these little um, box and whiskers are sitting above zero, which is meaning that we're expecting an increase in the standard deviation or the interannual variability of the East Asian, the South Asian, and probably also the Australian monsoon. So that will have a, potentially quite an impact on <coughs> people living in those regions. Um, so very briefly, um, for the South Asian monsoon, we expect um, an increase due to an enha enhanced land temperature contrast and increased moisture transport, as I said, and increased interannual variability. But I would just mention that there have been a few recent studies suggesting maybe the balance um, towards an actual reduction in South Asian monsoon rainfall um, and also a reduction in the duration. So I think that um, there's still quite a lot of active research on that topic. And I just wanted to finish off by mentioning or <coughs> introducing a little bit of work that I did with some colleagues, um, Arel Moisa in particular, at the Bureau of Meteorology. And we're trying to understand that really large model spread for the Australian monsoon. So we just looked at the average um, Summer rainfall for a box over northern Australia for our 33 different climate models. And we can see that uh, some of the models are predicting quite large reductions of up to about 43% and others up to almost 40% of increase um, at the end of the 21st century. So this is under um, 8.5, the, the, the high emissions um, scenario. And we wanted to try and kind of understand why the models are, are disagreeing with each other so much. And so we broke them into group basically the, the models that get um, substantially drier and those that get substantially wetter and tried to understand uh, dynamically what those models were doing that was different to each other. So just a few results. Um, we found that the drier models, the ones that got drier over northern Australia, so here's our northern Australia, but actually they were getting very wet over here in the, the equatorial Pacific. So they were the models that had a really strong enhancement of rainfall along the equator. Um, extending into the west here, whereas the ones that were getting wetter over Australia didn't really have that large um, equatorial signal, in particular not over in the west. Uh, and the difference between these guys, the dry models and the wet models shown here, is basically this bullseye uh, anomaly over the western equatorial Pacific. If we look at the SST warming in our different groups of models, um, the dry models here have this Warming, I mean, it's, it's um, common that most of the, the models do have some enhanced warming along the equator, but it's, it's even greater in, these, in the drier models here and much less in the wet models. So the difference between them is basically a large warming in the western equatorial Pacific. And so we're speculating that that's actually just driving um, the convection and the, the monsoon trough northward in those models, and we're not really seeing the rainfall over northern Australia in those models in the future warmer world. And so finally what we did was essentially just correlate um, the, the amount of rainfall change with the uh, warming or the amount of warming in the western equatorial Pacific. And so we find that 
Those models that warm more in that western equatorial Pacific are the ones that get, that get drier. Um, but we also found when we looked at the, how well those models capture the present day um, SSTs that over here, I haven't, I haven't shown the spatial plot, but basically the amount of bias, the error in the western equatorial Pacific was actually quite large in the drying models as well. So they tend to be too, um, too cold in the mean um, climate in this region and then they're warming more in that region in the warmer world and driving this, this drying response. So um, our conclusion in that study was that we probably had less confidence in the models that showed a drier Australian monsoon in the future and therefore we had more confidence that there'd be little change or an increase. So, I mean, that's just one example of the kind of work that I guess lots of people are doing all around the world to try and constrain um, projections for the monsoon and try and um, come up with some more robust and hopefully more um, narrow ranges of projections for all the different communities that are trying to adapt and um, make plans for the future um, living in the monsoon. So, that's all. And just wanted to um, give the references. I, I feel like I probably didn't really do such a good um, job of covering the first part of the, the regional monsoons, but there's really good coverage in that introduction to tropical meteorology, so please go and have a read of that. And also a nice study, um, Peter Webster back in 1987, where he kind of mapped out our elementary understanding of the monsoons. Um, there's a couple of textbooks, The Asian Monsoon by Bin Wang, and a recent book, The Monsoon and Climate Change, that just came out. And also really worth looking at the, the discussion in the IPCC uh, fifth assessment report. It's, 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 very, it's a very good, kind of good uh, balanced uh, review, I guess, of the state of knowledge um, for, for monsoon projections. So that's all. Thank you. <laughs>